that you're here this morning. We're just going to sing uh, one song up front. Uh, we have a lot to celebrate today, Tom's ordination. So we just want to invite you to stand to your feet and let's worship this morning.
with me. Father, we exalt you. Um, just for your goodness to our lives that whatever battles that we may face, you've already won. And so, God, I pray as we transition into this next part of Tom being ordained, that you just be with him and that um, you just be glorified. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. We're going to watch a quick story video before we um, get into some other things. You guys can watch this story video. I had the privilege and opportunity to go on the SOS spring break trip to Memphis. SOS is Service Over Self. It's uh, a group of people, the staff have chosen to live in one of two underserved areas of Memphis and engage in those communities and help bring up the value of the homes by putting roofs on homes using college students and high school students throughout the summer and also then to do leadership development with the youth in the area of middle school and high school kids. On one of the first evenings, the director spoke about their expectations and how they do service. And rather than be a soup kitchen where they lay out the food, the people come participate and then leave, um, they like to see it as a potluck where they bring their best dishes and they, the other people bring theirs and then they share life together and share Jesus together. And then I watched our students and the H2O students that we were paired with just take this and run with it. They um, served uh, Jean, who was the owner of the home that we were putting a roof on um, for, in ways that went up above and beyond just roofing her home. They engaged her throughout the week, um, pulled her into the group. The 18-year-old young man who was doing his first uh, roofing group, um, they gave him the respect he was due as his position, but yet they also pulled him in as one of them and enjoyed time with him throughout the week, laughing and, and having a great time and encouraging him. Um, I saw one of the girls a little bit nervous after the first day of being up on the roof, uh, be challenged by Becky to go back up the next day and she pressed through and did it and then she was up there the rest of the week. And not only that, then when we did have downtime, these kids just gave over and above and beyond. They saw things that needed to be done in the yard and they just set about doing it. We filled a dumpster full of um, tree limbs and tree, dead trees, leaves, full, filled her walkway with brush that they had cleaned up out of the backyard. Um, the director from, from SOS had to go back and bring out chainsaws and rakes and wheelbarrows so we could clean up her yard. And, and it was just amazing how much they did and how this woman felt afterwards. She just felt loved and cared for and expressed that over and over again. All of this, I, I think I saw Becky, one of our staff members, and how she modeled servant leadership with these kids. And the students just modeling servant leadership to each other, to the owner of the home, um, to Jean, to the young man leading our crew. Um, and watching her throughout the week just lead them and uh, challenge them to grow and mentor them. I just felt like if this is just an indication of what our other staff are like and the leaders that we're raising up, I am not at all surprised that we're going on 40 years in campus ministry with H2O and still have this great opportunity to reach out uh, to a huge mission field on campus and raising up other students to become student leaders and then become servant leaders and model Jesus. And my name is Nancy and this is my Memphis SOS story. Nancy, thank you so much for doing that. It's wonderful having these stories still pouring in from our spring break trips that we took last month. Thank you again for the leadership. Nancy, thank you for going down to Memphis with all those crazy students and, and Becky and all the leaders. Thank you for your leadership down there. What a wonderful uh, opportunity to be together. And as she said, glorify Christ through our servant leadership. So super blessed by that. We are so excited to celebrate these next couple weeks, as I mentioned last Sunday. Today we're going to be having Tom Gerbrick's ordination, which I'm so excited about. 
And then next week, we're going to be celebrating our, our baptisms uh, on April 21st. So it's really wonderful. Uh, in case you haven't been here, we've been talking about this a lot with Tom. We talk about the character development that we do over a long period of time. We talk about the ministry skills development and the observation of how he ministers and how our leaders minister so well, and then also the doctrinal aspect. Those are the three things that we're talking to them about and that we're very conscious of. And uh, these come from 1 Timothy 3 and from Titus. And I want to just read a little bit from Titus uh, as they're appointing elders there in uh, that place. It says, an elder must be well thought of for his good life. He must be faithful to his wife, and his children must be obedient. An elder must be blameless because he's God's minister. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. He must be hospitable. He must not be a heavy drinker, violent, or greedy for money. He must be hospitable by having guests in his home. He must have a strong and steadfast belief in the trustworthy message that he teaches and be able to refute those that disobey or that don't believe the truth. And so we've been walking through these verses with many men over the years, over the decades, and this is just always a very special time that we all in consensus feel that we're not appointing an elder today. We're recognizing that he uh, is doing all these things. So let's have Tom and Marin come up. We want to say some nice things about them. And Jack and Matthew and Ballard, come on up. And we're going to celebrate them and share some nice things about them and then lay hands on them and pray. And uh, very excited about this time. And your boys had a birthday? They did. All right. They're two years old. Very exciting. All right. Okay. So, Tom, we're going to talk about you for a little bit here. Um, (laughs) And I'm going to talk at you which will make it even more uncomfortable. But the two things that come to my mind when I think of you. So um, I had the privilege of leading Tom in a discipleship group for a couple of years at least and got to see you become a dad, see you sort of transition just to being on staff here in BG. The two words that come to my mind are selfless and faithful. Um, I'll start with faithful. You you just do what you say you're going to do. You follow through. And I think that that is a sign of character maybe even more than what we realize. And, and so I think about, um, and this kind of ties in with the selfless, watching you become a dad to twins <laughs> um, is, was such a gift for me to watch because all of a sudden life just got chaotic. <laughs> and the way that you served Marin, the way that you loved your boys, um, the selflessness day in and day out in that tough season of having newborns and two of them at the same time, um, I think it was just a gift to me to see this man has genuine character. He wants to be like Jesus. He wants to have the character of Jesus. You are so talented in your job. You are so good at what you do. And I'm sure a lot of us in this room have experienced that, especially those in youth and kids. You've seen just how naturally gifted you are as a leader. Uh, and I don't want to make light of that either, but the character, the selflessness, and your faithfulness. Um, just really sticks out. And that's really the essence of what it means to be a pastor. And so I'm excited for how our church is going to benefit from you uh, doing that for all of us now even more. Okay, now I get to talk about both of you. (laughs) So in 2019, I text Marin today to confirm. (laughs) You guys came and you joined my husband's and I city group and we got to know you guys and you were just so special. We loved being close to you. We loved the friendship that we were able to develop with you guys. And I feel like this moment just feels so special for me specifically with knowing you guys for so long and knowing you when you were just members in our city group. So this feels so special. And I feel like you both, Tom and Marin, you are the right people here to be ordained, Tom and Marin, to be supporting him. And you guys, um, I just can't thank God enough for putting you guys where you are. You guys are the right the right people to be leading this church. I've been here for a long time, and this just feels like such a special moment, having seen you guys get involved and then catch the vision of what we do and pursue staff and been able to kind of navigate that with you guys a little bit. And Tom, I'm just so thankful for your steadiness and your 
diligence and you are very, very thoughtful. Um, and I really appreciate that about you. And Marion, you're just such a good listener and you're so intuitive and you're such a good friend and you are just a gift. You guys are both a gift to this church and I hope you really know that. And I hope that you feel the spiritual weight of what a good, of what a gift and a privilege you are to this church. It's a very spiritual thing here today. Thank you. Well, Tom, this is a real pleasure for me. Um, I've known Tom since Tom and Marion came, but in the last six months, I've gotten to work very closely with him as we've worked together on the city side mm -hmm. and uh, just gotten to know him even better through those times. I think the word that, uh, the top of the list for me is integrity, that uh, <clears throat> Tom's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you did it before me today. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. So, <clears throat> but Tom's just a man of integrity. He's a very gifted man. He's a gifted administrator, which I very much appreciate, and I think all of us appreciate. But um, I think his integrity, above all, uh, is what matters. And uh, he's also a very good listener uh, and uh, somebody who can integrate a lot of ideas, uh, can listen to a lot of points of view and bring that together and summarize. I think that's something that we value in you as well. And um, <clears throat> most of all, you're a good leader, which means you're taking us, you're able to take people to good places and get results. And you've proven that certainly already with all that we, you've done with youth, and we just so much appreciate that. So, congratulations to you. Well, well deserved. Yes, we're so excited about today. So we're going to lay hands on you and pray. Since you're both very tall, we might have you stand on that step so that we can. I was really hoping you would say that. <laughs> You bow your heads and pray with us. Father God, we tell you that this is your church. Lord Jesus, you are the chief shepherd of this church. And we thank you that you have given us uh, an under shepherd of such high character, a man who truly knows you and desires to walk with you and whose life models the kind of obedience that we wish for everyone here in this church family. Lord, we thank you that it is you who have saved him and, and transformed him, have gifted him. And we just, we say, Jesus, thank you for the ways that your life is being lived out through Tom mm -hmm. and through Marin and in their marriage mm -hmm. and the ways that we have been and will continue to be blessed by them. God, would you protect them as they step out in greater leadership from any scheme of evil? And Lord, would you just empower them in your spirit uh, to, to lead, uh, to do so sacrificially and selflessly as they have so beautifully done in their time here. Mm -hmm. Thank you for them. Lord, we are so grateful for Tom and Marin. Lord, I'm so excited to have Tom as a co-pastor and we are just so grateful for your sanctification in their lives, your growth and your spirit dwelling inside Tom to bring him to this point today. So we honor you, Lord, and we thank you. And we give thanks for Tom as we lay hands on him, God, and we ordain him today. And we recognize the character and the skills and the doctrinal knowledge in his life, Lord. We pray that this would be a memorable day of celebration for him that you would protect him, protect him and protect their marriage and their family. And Lord, that he might glorify you more and more in his life. God, as a church, help us to be supportive of them. Help us to be remembering to pray for them and to serve them also as they lay down their lives for the church. Help us also to love them back and serve them. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Congratulations. Another round of applause for these guys. Give you a big hug. Thank you. Thank you too. We have some gifts. All right. So exciting. What a, what a blessing. When I first met Tom, he had a mustache. 
And I was, I was like, okay, I got to get to know this guy. And for a long time, I couldn't spell his last name, and I just had Tom Mustache in my cell phone. But I have officially changed that. So, well, thank you for celebrating that with us today. What a huge blessing. So excited about next uh, Sunday also to continue this season of celebration. We have the baptisms. We already have a bunch of people signed up. Uh, this is really kind of getting down to the last spots. If you have been uh, thinking about this, if you have questions, if the Lord has been putting this on your heart, please reach out to us. It's next Sunday. We'd love to talk to you about that and take you through our baptismal guide. So sign up, h2ochurch.com. If you're interested in baptism. And as a reminder for that special Sunday, for maybe some students that are here, the 10 a.m. and the 1130 service are here in this building. We couldn't find a spot on campus next Sunday. So we're going to do some baptisms at 10 a.m. And then some other people are going to get baptized uh, at 1130 next week. And again, in the spirit of celebration, as we do every year, after that service, we're going to have a big party. So big, big clap for that. You guys love to have fun together. So we're all going to head over to the rec center. Uh, if you come to the 10 a.m., you can head over there pretty soon because that party will start at 12 in the rec center. There'll be food and all kinds of fun things. You can do all kinds of great things in the rec there, including a climbing wall. And then after the 1130 service, we'll go over and join them. Uh, so remind people of that. Remind your family of that if you want to join us after those services next week on the 21st. So that's it. If you wouldn't mind standing up, say hi to somebody around you as Jaden comes up to finish us off in the book of Matthew. H2O. Am I on yet? Am I on? Good morning, everybody. Since it wasn't said, I just have to clarify, I love Tom more than everybody else that talked about him up here, just so you guys know. Tom and I have got to spend a lot of time together the last year, and it's been awesome, and, and he really does deserve being ordained today, so I'm thankful to, to get to preach on his ordination day. That's a big deal. That just shows how much of a servant leader he is. He didn't even want to preach on his own ordination day, so here we are. Today, we're going to be in Matthew chapters 24 and 25. So if you've got your Bible, you're going to want to get those out. We're going to go through all of it, and I'll have to summarize some of it. But before we get there, if you guys have gotten to know me a little bit as I've been on stage, and if you don't know me, I love movies. I often talk about movies. It's one of my wife and I's favorite things to do together is go see movies. But I want to tell you a little bit about my wife here. She is obsessed. I kid you not, obsessed with trying to guess the endings of movies and TV shows. And it drives me insane. It drives me nuts. We set a rule the second year that we were married. We were going to a movie one day, and she starts asking me questions like, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to end? I'm like, we need to clarify. You cannot ask me context questions for a movie I have not seen yet. I don't know what's going to happen. I want to be surprised. And even this last year, as Margaret turned one, I created a little recap video of, of all the videos that we have from her first year. And I'm showing it to her. It's about 15 minutes long. We get about seven, seven, eight minutes in, and she's like, is this going to end with her saying bye at the end? And I'm like, can you just let something be a surprise? <laughs> she was right. It did. But I'm like, can you just let something be a surprise for once? But you know what? I think her asking these questions actually is something that all of us can relate to. We all want to know what happens at the end of this life, of the end of time. What happens and we're so enamored with this that we continue to make movies, we continue to write stories about it, and it continues to be a topic of conversation everywhere. What's going to happen at the end? Jesus is going to tell us here what happens at the end in Matthew 24 and 25. He actually gives us direct foreshadowing about what's going to take place at the end of the age. So we're actually picking right up where Tom left off last week. He, he read through the woes of the Pharisees, and we're going to see that Jesus, as he's, he's about three days out from his crucifixion, he's walking out of the temple, and the disciples ask him this specific question. 
And this is called the Olivet Discourse. So he's going to be on the Mount of Olives here. And this is the last of the five major discourses that we see in the book of Matthew. The first one being the Sermon on the Mount. So he's going to talk about the seven-year tribulation that's going to happen and his second coming. And this is before he's already, he's already resurrected before. So that, this hasn't happened yet. So he's talking about the second time that he's going to come back. So the first two, chap, first two verses give us the context that we really need. So let's take a look at Matthew 24, verses 1 through 3, actually, not 2, 3 verses. It says, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So Jesus prophesies the fall of the temple, which actually does happen in AD 70 by the Romans. They take it apart piece by piece. And this temple was amazing. It's really large. We can kind of assume that it was maybe the size of about four football fields, five football fields. Think this is how big that this temple is. And it was coated with gold. It had gold all over it. The Romans took this apart brick by brick. And so Jesus giving us this prophecy, it's actually what's called a parallel prophecy, where it's partially completed at one point and then will be fully completed later. This gives us a picture of what and really an idea of the tone for the rest of everything Jesus is about to say. So he gives us the tone. And you know what? What's funny to me is the disciples actually broke the first rule of asking a good question here. They asked a double-barreled question. So they asked him two things in one. When will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming of the end of age? So the big idea for today, if you forget everything else I talk about, remember this. Jesus is coming back. Therefore, keep watch and stay ready. Jesus is coming back. Therefore, keep watch and stay ready. I've got five points for you today, so strap in. We're going to have a lot of fun. Okay, we're going to dive back in, starting at verse 4. Let's look at this together. Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end, of the, the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. <clears throat> All these are the, are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increased wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Let's pause right there. Point one is this. Our focus must be the gospel, not the end time signs. The first thing Jesus says in response to these questions of the disciples is this. Watch out that no one deceives you. Watch out that nobody will deceive you. Jesus doesn't give us a specific date. He doesn't give us a specific sign. He clarifies what's going to happen between his ascension and his return. And these are the 10 birth pains that he mentions. So let's take a look at them. He says such things must happen, but the end is still to come. These birth pains, they're going to be false messiahs. We, all of these things that we're going to talk about right now, we see these things happening right now, okay? So false messiahs, so just one example. Sung Young Moon of the Moonies, if you've ever heard of this guy, he claimed to be the Messiah in 1992. There will be false messiahs that are going to show up. Wars and rumors of wars. I could go down a whole list of these. The Civil War, World War I, World War II, the Cold War. Was that really a war or was it a rumor of war? I'm not really sure. How about conquests? We still see nation trying to take over nation today. Famines all over the place, earthquakes. And then he give us, gives us these five worst birth pains. The first five actually mirror Revelation 6, if you want to go read that later. These next five mirror Revelation 13. There's going to be persecution, hatred, and killing of Christians in this church age. I love when people say God has an awesome plan for your life. It might include persecution, hatred, and being killed. God has an awesome plan for you. Seven, many will turn away from the faith. There's going to be betrayal and hatred of friends. 
There will be false prophets deceiving people. And there's so many examples I could give of that. One that's been talked about a lot recently is Benny Hinn, false prophet. Number 10, increased wickedness and the love of most will grow cold. Out of all of these, this one freaks me out a lot more than the other ones do. The fact that our world will get so wicked that the love of most will grow cold. So for us, as we look at this, we should expect that society is going to get worse and worse. I could give you examples of how that's looking like today. But we should not allow that to make the love that's inside of us grow cold towards one another. Our focus must be on the gospel, not just these signs. Jesus even says, but see to it that you are not alarmed. We can see these these 10 things taking place, but it should not drive us to be freaking out, to be totally alarmed. Each of them should just be a reminder that Jesus is going to return. We're going to see these things happen over and over again. But here's what I want to call attention to. Verses 13 and 14, Jesus gives us two promises that I want you to focus on. The first one is this. The one who stands firm to the end will be saved. We can have assurance of our salvation because we know that if we follow Jesus, as we are in him, we will be saved. And we can see that all these signs are going to take place and we can still trust that the Lord is going to do something with us. And then he says this, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. There's 10 things, 10 signs of the end times that we're going to see, but guess what? None of those signs are going to impede on the gospel getting out to all the nations. You can walk in faith. You can be missional, knowing that no matter what of these things takes place, the gospel is going to go out, and we get to be a part of that. See, we're called to be missional despite what may be happening in our world. These signs are not given for us to just panic and freak out when we see them happening. It's supposed to remind us that Jesus is coming back. Our focus must be on the gospel, not the end time signs. Jesus goes on. We're just going to look at the next two verses in 15 and 16. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let's pause because I know this is a phrase that can cause a lot of alarm and confusion. The abomination that causes desolation. This is mentioned in the book of Daniel three times outright and then outlined a little bit one more time in chapters 8, 9, 11, and 12. This is really a decisive sign of the end times. There's going to be a seven-year tribulation, and about halfway through it, there's going to be this Antichrist that is set in a future temple. So in Jerusalem, there will be an antichrist that comes back to a temple that is not built right now. There will be a temple built, and he will come to rule for three and a half years before Jesus actually returns. This, now let me clarify the word antichrist. There are things in this world that are antichrist, think about it, that are, are not of God, are of the opposite of God. This is the specific antichrist figure that we actually see talked about in Revelation 13, that sign of the beast, Right? This is the abomination that causes desolation. That's the most simple definition I can give give to you. How this is going to look is this antichrist is going to come, and he's actually going to be accepted. He's going to be loved, and then he's going to turn and ramp up everything that we see. All of these signs are going to get worse and worse, and then Jesus is going to come back. And he gives us a little more clarity on what that's going to look like. So let's keep reading in verse 17 here. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. This is when the abomination of desolation shows up. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. Cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. I like that he throws those in there like, you better pray it's not going to happen in the winter. That's not going to be fun. (laughs) For then there will be great distress. And the ESV actually uses the word tribulation unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. So if someone tells you, There he is out in the wilderness. Do not go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms. Do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible, even in the west, 
so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there, will, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then will appear the sign of the Son of, of Heaven, Son of Man in heaven. And then all the people of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. I skipped a couple of verses there. I hope you caught up with me. Point two is this. Jesus' return will be obvious. When I was a kid, I used to panic that I was going to be asleep when Jesus returns. Maybe you've experienced this too. Or that I worry, like, what if I don't recognize him? What if he shows up and I have no idea that it's actually him? Am I going to be saved? Let it be known, as Jesus says here, his return will be very obvious. The seven-year tribulation is going to take place. The last days, which are right now, or we could call it the church age, there's going to be a greatest stress ever. That's the tribulation. But those days will be short. And then Jesus is going to come on the clouds. He's actually going to return right to the Mount of Olives, which is actually prophesied in Zechariah 14.4. Prophesies that Jesus is going to come right back to the Mount of Olives. The clouds will be split. It will be so obvious when Jesus returns. So he warns us here. If anyone says, there he is in the wilderness or out in this inner room, if anyone has the secret to the Messiah, they're a false prophet. Don't believe them. Jesus gives us this clear warning. And I have to poke at this. We just had a really cool solar eclipse, right? I know some of y'all saw the Facebook post. People predicting that this was a sign of Jesus coming back. Remember, our focus should not be on the signs. Our focus should remain on Jesus. Okay, Jesus' return will be obvious. Let's just read a little bit more. Now we're in verse 36. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be for the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with the handmill, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, part of our big idea, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house to be broken into. So you must also be ready. There's the other part of our big idea. Because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Point three is this. Nobody knows when Jesus is returning. One of the easiest ways to identify a false prophet is they tell you that Jesus is showing up at this specific time. Only the Father knows. Only. That's what it says in verse 36. So please do not be deceived by people predicting the exact time that Jesus is coming back. The year right now is 2024. And I'm, I just have a hunch. Once we get about 2,000 years out, there's going to be a lot of people predicting that Jesus is coming back. So I Googled it. Here's three people who think they know exactly when Jesus is coming back. Let's identify some false prophets today. Let's have some, <laughs> let's have some fun. Our first one is our friend uh, Daniel Speck. He wrote this, 2030, second coming, 2023, tribulation. He knows exactly when he's coming. This is a false prophet. Let's go to the next one. We got a few. All right, this is uh, Becton I don't know how to say his last name. Oh, we got cut off, but it says by 20, 2031. He says Jesus is without a doubt coming back in 2031. Let's go to the next one. We got one more. This is uh, Gabriel Ansley. He wrote a book about how Jesus is for sure coming back in 2033, which would be the end of his, when he re first resurrected, 2,000 years out from that time. All of these people who are making these predictions, false prophets, let it be known. You're going to see a ton of this stuff ramp up in the next 10 years, I promise. You're going to see it on Facebook. It's going to be going all over the place. Somebody's crazy grandmother is going to be talking about it. Let them know. Nobody knows the day or the hour. Nobody knows when Jesus is coming back. And Paul actually echoes this sentiment when he's talking to the Thessalonians about the day of the Lord. 
He says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 and 2, Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Jesus is just going to show up. He's going to show up. Nobody's going to have any warning of it other than these signs that he's already talked about. And Jesus actually connects this to the story of Noah's Ark and the flood. Tom and I are actually taking a seminary class right now on Genesis. So it's kind of cool that I get to see this little tie into the foreshadow that connects the Gospels to the Old Testament. So that flood that happened in the story of Noah that that wiped out everybody, that was foreshadowing the coming judgment that's going to happen. The ark itself is the covering salvation of Jesus, protecting us from God's judgment. And did you know this? On the ark, there's one single door that foreshadows Jesus talking about the narrow gate. There's only one way to find salvation, and it is through Jesus. Just as there was only one door to get in the ark, there's only one way to avoid the judgment of God. So Noah and his family, they heeded God's warning of judgment. Everybody else, they were just going on like their regular daily lives, just as everything was just business as usual. And we see Jesus say here, one will be taken, the other left. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, it says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. This is a picture of what's known as the rapture. Now, there's, there's different schools of thought of whether the, the rapture is going to take place before the tribulation, during the tribulation, or after the tribulation. We're not here to make the call today. We're just, we're just here to look at what Jesus says, which is simply that it's going to happen. Okay? It's going to happen. We're going to be with the Father. And then it says, the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So we just need to be ready. We need to keep watch and stay ready. The fact that we don't know when Jesus is returning is a reminder of how urgent this gospel message is. About a month ago when we were in Buffalo, we were doing some evangelism, talking to students out there, and I got this question twice, and I think it's a, it's a fair question, but let's talk about why it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Why shouldn't I just live however I want, and then when I'm on my deathbed, I can place my trust and faith in Jesus? Why shouldn't I do that? Well, the Proverbs is really clear in Proverbs 21 or 27, 1. Tomorrow is not promised. We don't know when Jesus is returning. There's an urgency to this. When God shows up and he asks the question, how are you living your life? Are you going to be okay with the answer that you would give? Why shouldn't I just live however I want and give my, give my life to, to Jesus on my deathbed? Because we don't know. We just don't know what's going to happen. You could die in a car accident later today. Our response to this free gift of salvation should be joy, knowing and having assurance that we are saved and can be with the Father. This urgency emphasized in the next three sections, Jesus gives us three parables. I'm not going to read them directly, but we're actually going to just highlight them. And point four is this, keep watch and stay ready. Jesus really wants to nail this point into the disciples' heads by giving them these three parables. It's the parable of the two servants, the ten virgins, and then the talents, or the bags of gold, depending on what you're reading. So these, each of these three, they say the same thing. Keep watch, stay ready. Keep watch, stay ready. And the last one tells you how to stay ready. So let's take a look. For the two servants, there's one servant who is marked as faithful. The other one gets impatient and starts living however he wants and not being honoring to his master. The faithful one is marked as wise. The impatient one is marked as wicked. Both are rewarded. The, servant, the wicked servant gets sent to hell. The other one is honored. The question here is, what would Jesus find us doing right now? If he was to show up right now and ask you, what have you been doing with your life? What would you answer that with? Would you say that you've been impatient? Or would you say that you've been honoring the Lord with your life and your time? Jesus then tells the parable of the ten virgins. And this is the beginning of Matthew chapter 25. So the 10 virgins, really what they are is a wedding party. There's about to be this, this wedding ceremony. In, in Jewish culture, it was a little different. So 
The fact that there are virgins doesn't mean a whole lot. All it means is that there were there's these 10 women who were part of a wedding party. It says in there that five of them were wise and five of them were foolish. They each had a lamp, and the five wise ones also had oil for their lamps, ready to go for whenever the bridegroom was going to show up. The other five did not have oil. They figured once the bridegroom shows up, I can go get some. And that's what happens. Let's read in, in Matthew 25, 10 through 13. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. When Jesus returns, don't wait for that moment to, to show up and say, Lord, now I'm here. Make the decision today. And then in the, the, ter- the parable of the talents, we see three servants. The master gives one of them five bags of gold, one of them two bags of gold, and the, the other one bag of gold. To each of the, the ones that had five and two, they doubled what they had. They invested the money that was given to them, and when his, their master returned, they had invested and gave it back, and they were rewarded. In Matthew 25, 21, it says this, his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. He said this to both those who received the five and the two bags. But the one who received one bag, he hid his gold in the ground and did nothing with it. He was scared to do anything with it because he didn't want to lose it. Jesus, or the master returns and says, you wicked, lazy servant. Jesus gives us this principle through this parable. Multiply your faith. Romans 12, 3 tells us that each of us has been distributed a little bit of faith. It says, for by the grace given me, as I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. So each of you have been distributed an amount, kind of like the five bags or the two bags or the one bag. Doesn't matter how much you've been given, but are you multiplying your faith? Are you investing that into the kingdom? It makes me think about during the, the pandemic, I had a little bit of money and I threw it into AMC, which is a series of movie theaters. My money was almost 10 times what it was once movie theaters opened back up. That was a great investment. How are you investing in your spiritual life? I'll give you three practical ways you can do that. Invest your time. There's a multitude of ways that you can serve people. You can disciple people. You can share the gospel by evangelizing. You can support ministries with prayer. You can encourage your friends. Invest your time in the kingdom. I want to shout out our group leaders today. If you're a leader of a student group, could you stand up? I don't know if we have anybody here today. Do we have anyone? Oh, we have a couple. Can you give these guys a hand? You guys get sit. Let me share why I'm pointing them out. They don't get paid. They make this decision to just want to invest their life into other people. We're moving from 10 student groups this year to 14 next fall. Praise God. That only happens by multiplying faith, by investing in people, spending your time to raise up new leaders. It's a sacrifice. I've heard it before from seniors. I just want to enjoy my senior year. But I've heard it from other seniors. I want to raise up the next generation. Invest your time. You can also invest your talents. Many of you are good at a multitude of random things. You can join a team in our church. We have a ton of ways you can serve. You can leverage your hobbies for the gospel. I've got a buddy who leads a golf group. He's good at golf. He invites guys to golf with him. And over 18 holes, he starts asking questions about how's your life? How's your marriage? What do you believe about God? He's leveraging his hobbies, his talents for the gospel. You can also invest your treasure. I feel like I talk about this every time I get on stage. You can invest in your local church. You can, ins- you can support missionaries. You can give to those in need. There's a multitude of ways that you can use what you have to invest in the kingdom of God. I was watching these random videos. Have you guys ever seen those people who interview people on the sidewalks randomly? 
there was this guy who went to a retirement community down in Florida, and he starts asking everybody these same questions. What have you learned about life? What are your biggest regrets? What would you tell your younger self? Every single one of these people said this. They've learned that material things don't matter and that relationships matter more than money. All these people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s were saying this, that money didn't matter as much as they thought it did. What are you doing with your finances to invest in the kingdom? We also get a picture of how not to stay ready here. If we take a look at the guy with one bag who just buried it in the ground, this guy did three things, or I should say he didn't do three things. He didn't think about how he could invest it. He just buried it. He didn't work to invest it. And you know what? He didn't even try. He didn't make an effort. He didn't even risk failure that something good might come of it. In James 2.17, it says, In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Now, it's not the works that we do that save us. That is just the outpouring of when we get saved, we can be encouraged and want to serve others because of how Jesus has loved us. I'm going to paraphrase Charles Spurgeon here and ask you this or give you this statement. At the end of each of your lives, God is not going to ask you, what did H2O Church do for the kingdom? He's not going to ask you, what did your family do for the kingdom? Jesus is going to ask you, what did you do for the kingdom? We're going to have to make an account for our lives. Spiritual laziness is a sin to be repented of. And I want to ask you today, are you spiritually lazy? How much easier is it to start doing something than it might be to stop doing something? Be encouraged if you want to share that with somebody this week. There's a multitude of ways you can jump in, and people will be really excited to see you do that. Let's dive back into the text. We're now in Matthew 25, verse 31. This is our last section as we tie things up. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all angels, all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and then give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothing and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, the goats, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous, the sheep, to eternal life. Point five is this, don't just claim Jesus, obey him. When Jesus returns, he's going to judge all the nations. That's this picture that we get right here. He's going to split everybody into two categories. You either loved the Lord and served him, or you didn't. This section has less to do with the actions that these people took, the way that they fed and clothed. It has way more to do that with the heart that led them to live their lives. They lived their lives a different way because they had faith in Jesus. And those who trust and obey Jesus will end up serving the least of these. It's just going to happen at some point. When you love Jesus and you see opportunities to serve people, it's just going to happen. You're going to do it. You're going to make those choices. And I share all this because I don't want anybody in here to have a false sense of salvation today. 
Claiming the name to be a Christian, to be following Jesus, means that we obey him. It says that in the Great Commission that Pardee talked about two weeks ago. It says at the end of there, teaching everyone to obey all that Jesus commanded us to do. That is a part of following Jesus. It's not a list of rules. It's a lifestyle we live. Now, I want to point out, too, that in this this whole section between these two chapters, Jesus mentions hell four times. He says it in Matthew 24, 51, and then in Matthew 25, he mentions it in 30, 41, and 46. It's described as a place where the, with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There will be darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There will be an eternal fire and eternal punishment. But there's one thing I really want you to catch that Jesus said about hell in here. When he said, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, highlight this in your Bible, prepared for the devil and his angels. People choose hell. God never created hell for you and I. We're not meant to be there. God wants us in relationship with him. He prepared hell for the devil and his angels. But with the encouragement we have at the end of this in verse 46, Jesus says that the righteous will enter into eternal life. Remember this, Jesus is coming back. Therefore, keep watch and stay ready. Do you today have assurance that you are in Christ? That if he was to return today, that you are in Christ? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the fact that you've given us these signs, the fact that we can look at the world and be continually reminded that you are going to return. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us that something here would ring true. Lord, we know that your word says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Lord, if if any of these talks of the end times freak us out, Lord, would you comfort us knowing that we can be in you just like Noah and his family were a part of the ark and we're, we're washed away in judgment and we're protected from it. Lord, can we also be protected from your judgment by having a relationship with you? Lord, we pray that as, as you prepare and as you prepare us for your return, Lord, that we would faithfully serve you. God, if we've been spiritually lazy, would you convict us of that? And whatever it looks, the first next step, whether that's just talking to someone about how to invest in our spiritual lives, Lord, would we take that step in boldness? Would we repent of our spiritual laziness and just start walking with you? God, I pray for all of us today that we would continue to invest in our spiritual lives and keep on our mind that you are returning. It's described as your imminent return. It could happen at any time. Lord, would we keep that at the forefront of our minds? In your name we pray. Amen. We might just
Praise the Lord. He is coming back. Let's live like that this week. That was so helpful, so convicting to me. Thank you so much, Jaden, that we can live in a way that glorifies him. And he's given every one of us these gifts and talents. He's been so generous to us. Let's be generous with our talents to go love people, serve people, pray for people, and tell them about Jesus. It's great to be together today. Don't forget to uh, encourage Tom and Marin. So excited for his ordination today. And we look forward to seeing you back here next Sunday to celebrate those baptisms. Uh, the 10 and the 1130 will be here, and then the big party after that on April 21st. We love you guys so much. Let's go out into the world and glorify our Lord. Have a great day. Amen.